to you from New York City. I'm your host, Marianne Costello, and you are watching Bear All, where we get to the heart of the matter with our guests, like today's guest is Tony Luke Jr., our special show topics and healthy lifestyles. And in the studio with me is Rich Shalanda. Hey, How are you? Man. What's up? I'm good. good. I see you're wearing a scarf today. Well, I was debating, uh -huh. and everyone seems to like it, including Tony. So. Uh, it stays on. It stays on. I <laughs> like it. I really do. Thank you. And thank you so much for being with me again Always. today and I'm putting here. up with my shenanigans. I'm here. Okay, so when we come back to Bear All, we will get right to our special guest today, Tony Liu. We'll be right back. Hey guys, my name is Danny Felt. I am a singer, songwriter, and music entrepreneur, CEO of Danny Felt Consultants. So I got started in music as a singer, songwriter. I was in studios since I was 14 years old, writing and recording music. I started a company called Danny Felt Consultants, which is a company to help connect music producers, photographers, web designers, and so much more. I have such a huge passion for helping people, for marketing, and for spirituality, and I just really wanted to combine them all into one. So I decided to create this really awesome program to help musicians with not only marketing, but empowering their mindset. We need more positivity and empowerment for musicians as a whole and the world as a whole, and I feel like this is a really great starting place. I look forward to seeing you inside the program. back and you are watching Bear All and I'm your host Marianne Costello and Rich we're gonna get right to it yep. right now with our guest our guest today is not only an entrepreneur a restaurateur but he is an actor a musician and an entertainer he is the CEO of Tony Luke's international sandwich destination that is the real taste of South Philly and he is the founder of the hashtag brown and white initiative to end the stigma of heroin addiction let's welcome the man of many talents and an incredible enormous energy Tony Luke jr. to the show Hi, how are you doing how are you? It's great to be on the show, thank you. Yeah. Rich is the man. I know he is. He's the man. Yeah. And he puts up with me, so that's what makes huh. it great. Mm, I'm not even going to go. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming all the way to our show today. It was great. It is great. And I'm going to just get right into all it. All right, okay? I'm ready. All right, here we go. It is no secret that you are the CEO of an international sandwich destination, Tony Luke's. Do you enjoy creating cheesesteaks that people come from all over the world just to get the taste of South Philly? Well, I'll tell you, look, any, any cook or chef or, you know, anyone that, that's involved with food, the greatest pleasure we get is watching someone eat that food and enjoy it. And everyone has their own little technique in the way they do it. People ask me all the time, what makes your cheesesteak better than someone else's? And my answer is always the same. It's not better than anyone else's. It's different. You know, I mean, <coughs> taste is relative. That's why when anyone says to me, I do this the best, I'm the, I go, you know, mm, nah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's relative to what people like, what they don't like. I do the best job that I can. And in business, if enough people share your taste buds on what you like, then 
it becomes, you know, it becomes a success. And I enjoy doing it, and we do it right. We, we, we cook it a little slower. It takes a little longer to get your order than it would normally, but, and we make everything to order. All the rolls are baked at our store. And it's those little touches that, is, those old fashioned kind of things that we do that I think really make a difference. They do. So inquiring minds want to know, at least I know I want to okay. know, is there a secret recipe for your tea huh. steaks? Uh, look, <laughs> no, we use ribeye steak. Uh, mm -hmm. We season our steak before we put it on the roll. Uh, we cook it slow. We cook it on a uh, low temperature. So it gets very, very juicy. On a thick steak, people love to sear it. Load okay. it with salt when it's raw, then sear it. It gives it a nice crust and it caramelizes it. But on a very thin cut uh, piece of ribeye, the last thing you want to do is salt it while it's raw because oh. that salt will draw out all oh. the moisture and then you're going to wind up with a piece of dry rubber. Oh. That's amazing because a lot of times you hear, you know, salt and pepper your food before, you know, or nah, as it's cooking. Ah, ribeye steak, no. <laughs> Thank God I After. don't make cheesesteak, huh? <laughs> <laughs> now, since you have a love for cooking, you have a new food show called Foodin' Around. That's P-H-O-O-D-I-N. Yeah. What is the premise of the show? It's kind of funny food. It's like uh, my co-host is uh, John Cole, who is a literally an expert at mobile food trucks mm -hmm. and just restaurants in general. He goes everywhere. And I know food. I love food. But I like to joke around and kid. So, and I like to go on these rants. Right. So John is the info and I'm kind of like the comedy. And hmm. when you listen to the show, you'll realize that it's not just information about food. It's fun. And when callers call in, I have a blast. But my mind always goes towards comedy more than it does food. And John always kind of keeps me in line <laughs> with the food. Keeps me from swaying too far, right. too far over. So anybody can call in? Oh yeah, anybody calls in, we're on um, something called Wildfire Radio. You can download the app. We're on every other Thursday. We just did it this Thursday, so it won't be, this Thursday come up, be the following. We're on from 7 to 8 p.m., but you can go on now. We're on iTunes, you can look at it. Okay. But it is P-H-O-O-D-I-N uh, for Philly, so fooding around. Ah, oh, I was trying to wonder why you came up with yeah, that. Yeah, because of Philly. But we go everywhere to eat and joke and laugh and just, we have a ball. And that's what food should be, fun. It should be fun. So you go job. to any restaurant, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, and sometimes we don't even go to a restaurant. We just talk about what we did this week in food or about places that we've been to prior. Oh. And then we talk about that. And then we just, I went I, on, on the number two show, I literally went on a rant about truffles for 25 minutes. Do you like them? Dirt? No. I would not pay. <laughs> it's like paying $1,000 a pound for topsoil. I tell people, you want truffles, just go grab a handful of dirt, throw it on your food, and you save a ton of money. So you don't like them. So that was your rant for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, how people can pay for dirt. I don't know. So if you don't like truffles, is there something else you would replace that with? Uh, and any other kind of, any, well, <laughs> look, there's no secret. I know cheesesteaks is my thing, uh -huh. but pizza is the greatest food <laughs> ever invented, ever. As said every man. <laughs> ever. I agree. I agree. You know, it's the, it's the greatest, right. I mean, it's amazing. Pizza is just amazing. And again, I love the cheesesteak. Love it. But pizza, uh, <laughs> and it has everything I can eat. I'm not supposed to eat bread. I'm not supposed to eat cheese. Yet, there I go. And I can't eat one slice. I just take a pie and fold it in half. <laughs> right. Which is the easiest thing for me. So now you can make a pizza cheesesteak? Well, they have it, it now. Oh, actually, they do. In Philly. I forget what they call it. A, uh, a, a cheesesteak, I guess they call it a cheesesteak taco, but they take it. Lorenzo's Pies has this giant slice. It looks like a half a pizza. And then they, uh, they put the uh, cheesesteak and then they roll it. Uh -huh. And they eat it because <laughs> the cheesesteak or the pizza alone is it enough calories? <laughs> you need to add both together. Absolutely. <laughs> well, rumor has it that you have a new invention. It's the round hot dog. It's the round dog. What <laughs> inspired you to invent this? I was at a diner with my son, Michael, and he ordered a cheeseburger, and I had ordered eggs. And the cheeseburger came, and he went to bite, and he goes, you know what? I love hot dogs, but why aren't they like a burger? Like, it's just so much easier. And I remember saying to him, because a burger's a burger, a hot dog's a hot dog. <laughs> and then about a week later, he was having a barbecue at his house, 
and he walked by me. He said, see, I have to leave now to go get hot dog <laughs> buns because all I have are burger buns. And I thought, wait a minute, huh. there's something here. <laughs> and everyone laughed at me. They thought I was crazy. Right. And we went on QVC. And it's not, it's look, people go, oh, it's a round slice of bologna. It's not bologna. Okay. It doesn't look like it. It's very complicated. The design is like nothing you've seen. It is amazing. We went on QVC. We're completely sold out in three minutes. Mm. Yeah, and you have a waiting list, too. And the other thing is, too, I'm not saying it eliminates the choking hazard, but what people choke on is the cylinder of the hot yeah. dog. So it lessens the percentage of choking you would get with a regular hot dog. And, uh, it, and let me tell you something, it's probably one of the best tasting, uh, mm. the round dogs you would ever have. It's is an old it recipe. It's out, it really is outstanding. Is mm. it thick, is it thin? It's like about three ounces, so it's about that thick. Okay. And wow. it has ridges, so even if you fry it in the pan, it has like grill marks on it. Oh, Because oh, really? it's rigid, like a Ruffles ridges. Oh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Like a potato <laughs> chip, it's rigid. <laughs> and it's, and the reviews on QVC have been all four and five star reviews. Wow. Did you expect to sell out in the record time that you did when you you no. know, debuted it? No, I mean, it was a big challenge, you know, because certain things are iconic. You know, when people are like, a hot dog's a hot dog, it's iconic. People got so angry at me, <laughs> you know, sending me emails, how dare you, you're an idiot. It's, you, oh, congratulations, really? Tony, you discovered baloney. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not baloney. Hey. And then pretty soon, when people start buying it and then they start seeing the reviews, they realize that, really? No <laughs> one came up with this prior. That's what I thought. No one came up. But I'm telling you, the hot dog bun, I think there's a contract out on me <laughs> from the people that make hot dog buns. But we're not selling enough round dog yet for right. them to actually execute to the execute contract. That. Yeah. Now, are you selling it? You sold it on QVC. Are you selling it in stores? We're working on that now. Yeah, in fact, everyone is interested in getting the product. All food services, restaurants have called me because you cook it just like a burger. I mean, and I'm telling you, the taste is absolutely, and you could stack it. You know what happens when you stack a hot dog with 20 <laughs> items? It winds up on your pants right. or on your shirt, not in your That's mouth. That's true, right. And it's like, boom, like that. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. So now, I want one now. The, well, the no, manufacturers of the hot dog buns must love you right now. Well, there's still sausage. They still have sausage. <laughs> I can take that from them. Oh, this is true. So, I know that you could be find it on social media under hashtag uh, original round dog, is it? Uh, it is the original round dog hashtag, yes. I think it's fantastic. I absolutely do. Yeah, there's great pictures on there too, what the round dog looks like. So are you thinking about any new inventions with food? Or are you going to stick with the round dog for now? No, just the round dog is, <laughs> this is enough for one lifetime, Mary. <laughs> Take it easy. I'm just saying, you know. There's not much more I can reinvent. You know, <laughs> this pizza's already square. This so it ain't like, I can go around pizza, let's make it square. It's already <laughs> done. Well, this is true. Um, are you going to sell the round hot dog at Tony Luke's? Uh, we will eventually, yes. Oh. And that's going to be on the round bun, the not the long. The bun, yeah. All right, well, I'm just checking because you sell cheesesteaks. Well, so. it's hard to put a round dog on a long roll. No. Kind of def you know, it defeats the whole purpose. Them. Yeah. Because most people literally cut a, um, a hot dog down the middle, open it, you know, and then put two of them on like, you know, right. white bread. You know, like, yeah, you don't have to. So <laughs> now what I just thought of is that you just changed the hot dog eating contests. You know how they have them and they keep eating how yeah. many at a time? It's going to be a little harder. They That's what I'm saying. They can't water and just swallow it. No, so they can't. they, they got to actually chew it. <laughs> well, I absolutely love it. I can't wait to taste it. So I can't so, wait to taste it. It really is amazing. It really is. But we have to take a break. And you can join in the fun that we will have with our special guest, Tony Luke Jr., when we come back to Barrel. Stay tuned.
Got an idea for an invention? Don't know what to do next? Call my friends at InventHelp. InventHelp has helped over 10,000 inventors get patents. You can meet with an InventHelp representative who will keep your idea confidential and explain their invention process step by step. And InventHelp's data bank includes over 9,000 companies who have agreed to review new ideas like yours. Are you ready to put InventHelp in your corner? Call now, 800-351-1395. Hey guys, my name is Danny Felt. I am a singer, songwriter, and music entrepreneur, CEO of Danny Felt Consultants. So I got started in music as a singer, songwriter. I was in studios since I was 14 years old, writing and recording music. And I started a company called Danny Felt Consultants, which is a company to help connect music producers, photographers, web designers, and so much more. I have such a huge passion for helping people, for marketing, and for spirituality, and I just really wanted to combine them all into one. So I decided to create this really awesome program to help musicians with not only marketing, but empowering their mindset. We need more positivity and empowerment for musicians as a whole and the world as a whole, and I feel like this is a really great starting place. I look forward to seeing you inside the program. Inside out, outside in, two hearts touch, love. And we are back on Marianne Costello, and you are watching Bear All. And our special guest today is Tony Luke Jr. And you just made me hungry after that last huh. segment. No. It's around though. So now we get to have a little bit of fun with you. I'm not bearing all. I'm not doing it. I'm oh. leaving my shirt on. Now I'm gonna have to come up with something else, right? <laughs> we are gonna play a game. And uh -oh. you are gonna play for some prizes that we have here for you. All okay. Right. And you're going to get to pick your category and the name of the game is Celebrity Chefs, Music or Movies. Celebrity Chefs, Music or Movies. <laughs> I love it. It's great. He's the best. <laughs> so, pick your category, celebrity chefs, music, or movies. Let's start oh. with movies. <laughs> You're going to do movies. Yeah, let's start trying movies. Okay. This movie debuted in 2006 and was based on a 30-year-old bartender from South Philadelphia who overcame long odds to play for the NFL's Philadelphia Eagles in 1976. It was written by Brad Gann and directed by Eric Singor. Both Mark Wahlberg and Elizabeth Banks were featured in this movie, along with other cast and crew members. Was it The Blind Side, Invincible, Jerry Maguire, or Rudy? Well, that's not a very fair question because I'm in that movie. <laughs> that's a very fair so question. I'm in the movie. It's Invincible. That is correct. Yay. And you played the Cape Claw fan. Green Cape guy, yeah. Oh, come on, tell us about that experience. It was actually pretty cool. I just got done doing a film called Tenth and Wolf. And uh, I got back to Philly, and my agent called, and she had said that uh, there was like a role for like one line for a, like a rowdy fan, and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, nah, you know, I just, I just did a supporting role. I don't want to go back and do one. You know, I, I felt like I was going backwards. But they can't send you one line when they send you sides. So right. they, and then I saw this very small, tiny role of, of a character named Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. And he was like 6'3", 120 pounds soaking wet, long, long hair. And I was 5'8", 400 pounds and bald. <laughs> and I was like, that's the role that I want to play. So my agent was like, well, you don't fit. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but that's what I want. And just get me the audition. So I go and there's all these thin, skinny, tall guys. And they're looking at me as if, you know, are you all right in the head? Because this. So I go and I do the audition and they thank me for coming. And I just wanted to audition for it because I, I love the concept. And then about two weeks later, I get a phone call from the casting agent and she said, come in, the director wants to speak to you. And I remember walking in and he was there and, and there was someone from Disney. And I said, what's up? And he said, I have a dilemma. And I'm like, well, what's your dilemma? He said, do I get an actor that fits the role or do I let the role fit the actor? Uh -huh. And I remember saying, so you brought me down here to tell me I didn't get the job. <laughs> and he said, don't shave, don't, don't do anything, give me two weeks to decide. I really have to decide. And 
I got the call two weeks later and I had gotten the role and I remember putting the outfit on and the cape and I had these long sideburns, like these chops, <laughs> these 70s chops. And I remember, I know a lot of Teamsters right. and you know, that's all there are on, on movie sets. And I remember coming out of the trailer and there were like a ton of Teamsters and they were like, what the? <laughs> and they were like, Tony Lou, I'm like, yeah, it's me, stop <laughs> laughing. And I remember going on set and Erickson Kaur was so great. Uh, but it wasn't a comedy, it was not supposed to be comedic. But I played the, the role that as if the, the guy trying out for the team really wanted to be in the team. And because of that, it became comedic. Right. And I remember him saying to me, Tony, I tone it down, I tone it down. You know, and I'm like, man, <laughs> tone it up, tone it up. And uh, he started laughing and that was only that one little part. And then I remember him saying to me, being here tomorrow at 7 a.m. For what? We're gonna add you to another scene. Then I finished that, he goes, come here at 7 a.m. We're gonna add you for another scene. And Believe it or not, they literally kept 95% wow. wow. of everything yeah. we did. And it was really good when he, he did an interview on NBC and he had said one of his favorite characters that really stuck out was the Cape Clad Eagle fan. And it was, it was such an honor to do it. And I'm very good friends with Vince right. Papali. He's a great guy, his whole family's awesome. And um, it was a lot of fun doing that role. It'll never go away. No, so. when we don't want it to we'll either. Always be That's a great there. part and a great movie. <laughs> that yeah. is a great yeah. movie. So you did good. Thank you. So you ready? Celebrity <laughs> chefs, music or movies? See, I'm supposed to be the music guy, but I don't know what you're going to ask me. <laughs> and it may be a group I've never followed. And then celebrity chefs will get mad. So you know what? I'm going to go with music. I know this is a mistake, but I'm going to do it. Okay. You're from Philadelphia, right? Oh, uh, here. Now you're really going to hit me with one. Okay. If I don't get this right. These two men have what is now 57-year partnership of writing and producing music together and created the sound of Philadelphia. They share over 3,000 song credits that have earned them 15 gold singles, 22 gold albums, and many other accolades. Their first million selling record was Cowboys to Girls. In 1971, they created a new label, Philadelphia International Records, known as PIR. People like the music they heard coming out of Philadelphia. You know the answer, don't you? I do, you gave me an easy one, so that's good. Yeah. That would be Gamble and Hop. See, you knew it, you don't have to worry now. She pre-screened these, I know she did. <laughs> what would he know? Give him something that he would know. There's a possibility that Rich You're might have had some influence. You're a good woman and Richie's a great guy. So, <laughs> so he did Gamble it. Gamble and Huff, right? Yeah. Gamble yes. and Huff, they're ama amazing. They literally are the Philadelphia Sound. Well, we were thinking, uh, you growing up as a kid, listening to uh, some of that, that Philly stuff. I got a little trivia. Most people don't know. Yes. I'm speaking about Gamble and Huff, Philly International Records. Yes. That burned down. The recording studio burned down. My tribute to you is, who was the last artist to record at that studio before it burned down? I don't have a clue. Tony Luke Jr. Really? Wow. I literally re finished recording, went home, <laughs> studio burned down. Wow. Hmm. So I'm like, this needs to be in a trivia book. <laughs> yeah. It does. Did you have anything to do with that? No, I was home. I was long gone. <laughs> oh, I thought you were smoking. No. <laughs> Okay, so moving on. Celebrity chefs, music or movies? Well, let's go with celebrity chefs. Okay. This celebrity chef debuted on the Food Network in 1994 and continually hosts programs that bring cooking tips and information on American Regional Fair to a national audience. This celebrity chef owns five restaurants that include Gato in New York City and Mesa Grill in Las Vegas, Nevada, and currently works with his B-team members and offers suggestions for exercise regimens, apps for your smartphones, the latest in workout gear, and everything that has to do with trying to lead a fit for life. So, is it Duff Goldman, Guy Fieri, Alton Brown, or Bobby Flay? I'm gonna go with my boy Bobby Flay. Yes, you got it right. <laughs> Am I I'm making the camera guy crazy? Stop <laughs> doing <laughs> this, Tony! But I'm starting to do it. Yeah. I feel myself. I'm doing it too. I'm doing it too over here. So. Well, you were a guest Whee! on the Throwdown with Bobby Flay. I was. Bobby's a good man, and he's a dear friend of mine. Was it well. a cheesesteak throwdown? It was a cheesesteak throwdown, and I really look. I'm going to answer this question 
once and for all. They're like, well, you knew Bobby. And I had no concept <laughs> that it was a throwdown. I literally believed that I was doing a pilot for the Food Network. And I thought Bobby came by <laughs> to say hi and wish me luck. Not because if you look at my face, there's no acting when I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was it was great. It was so great. Did they tell you on camera when they finally had Bobby Flay there, you're having a throwdown? No, he did. Because ah. he came up and I was like, Bobby, I'm like, oh, thanks for coming by. And he's like, uh, how about we do a throwdown, me and you right now? My face was just like, because let me tell you something. If you know anything about Philadelphia, if yes. I would have lost that throwdown, <laughs> you're done. You're done. I would have moved to another city. Really? Yeah. So did he, because Bobby Flay is great. But he'll start taking different kinds of cheeses, mixing them on this throne. You just did your simple thing and just gave it to the judges? Actually, no. Bobby came bringing some exotic stuff. So uh -huh. instead of making a regular cheesesteak, I made what we call a cheesesteak Italian, uh -huh. which was with broccoli rob and sharp provolone, Ooh. which was risky. Yes. And uh, Bobby's grill was too high. I mean, oh. what, in the end, what hurt him was that the grill was too high. Oh. You know, he was scraping, scraping, and it's, you know, it was just a little too high. But he did say something that I really respected, and I love that he did. He said, most people look at someone making a, a cheesesteak, and they think it's just throw some meat on the grill and put some cheese and put it in a roll. He said, but there are so many techniques and temperatures and when to move the steak and when to season the steak, he said, which literally makes one place different from another. And it was really true. It's mm. not easy to just throw meat on the grill. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. No, but I'm happy that you won because he usually has a pretty good percentage where he wins the throwdowns. So you're, you I know, I was an sweating exception. it out because <laughs> I have so much respect for him and he's a brilliant chef. And he's also a really good guy. Is he? Well, he really good. is, yeah. So we're going to move on. Celebrity right. chefs, movies or music? Oh, I feel like I'm on the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try, let's try movies again. Okay, here we go. This drama movie was recounted by the father-son that spanned over three decades that examined the father's infamous and tumultuous life and the attempts he and his wife made to hold the family together amongst tragedy and multiple prison sentences as he rose to become the Teflon Don. It was written by Leo Rossi and Lem Dobbs and directed by Kevin Conley. Is it Gotti, Mafia, Code of Conflict, The Iceman, Confessions of a Mafia Hitman, or Cartel Land? These are loaded questions <laughs> because you know it's another movie that I was in and it is Gotti. It is Gotti and you started the movie as No Ears. No Ears. And you, <laughs> they were gone, No Ears. And you had your own scene with John Travolta. With me and John, yeah. John actually, John is a wonderful human being who I actually didn't get to know on set that well, but when we toured to promote the film, I really got to know him and Kelly, and um, he's a truly, him and Kelly are really beautiful, beautiful human beings, truly, mm. truly. So you had a great time doing that movie. I did, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was late at night, and it was in the parking lot, and it was, um, it was, it was a great experience. And John was always like uh, uh, an idol to me. Like, you know, no one at my age bracket grew up wasn't Saturday Night oh, no. Fever and Grease and Everything. Blow and all these, and all these films. So to actually be working with him, it was, uh, it was really, really such an honor. And we actually saw the movie Gotti. Oh yeah. We saw you, and all of a sudden we're watching, and then there's you in this parking lot with the car. I'm like, hey, that's Tony Luke. Without you know? the beard. We, we kept going back and, watch, and watch watching. Watching that scene, there. it was great. I tell people, don't blink though. <laughs> don't sneeze during the scene, or I'll be. I thought I saw Tony, nice. but where did he go? Well, Tony, we have a winner, and yes, they were loaded questions because we wanted everybody to get to know about you. So now to reveal your fun gifts, just for playing. For music, you have some candy for a rock guy, which, by the way, you might want to hold up because I just I love this. It. My diabetes will love this. I'm and for I'm Invincible, we have a oh, little football look at for this. you. <laughs> How cool is this? And for celebrity chefs, you could cook something with love. Oh my God. And to cuddle up and a little taste of bear all, we have something to cuddle oh. up with 
for the evening and you could remember us monkeying around and doing our thing. This is awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> so that way you have a little something. This some... is great. <laughs> Let's so just have a little fun and thank you so much. This <laughs> is awesome. <laughs> giving it to us. But I'm Marion Costello. And when we come back, our special guest, Tony Luke Jr., will be bringing out into the open some personal information as he bears all when we come back next. Got an idea for an invention? Don't know what to do next? Call my friends at InventHelp. InventHelp has helped over 10,000 inventors get patents. You can meet with an InventHelp representative who will keep your idea confidential and explain their invention process step by step. And InventHelp's data bank includes over 9,000 companies who have agreed to review new ideas like yours. Are you ready to put InventHelp in your corner? Call now, 800-351-1395. Hey guys, my name is Danny Felt. I am a singer, songwriter, and music entrepreneur, CEO of Danny Felt Consultants. So I got started in music as a singer, songwriter. I was in studios since I was 14 years old, writing and recording music. I started a company called Danny Felt Consultants, which is a company to help connect music producers, photographers, web designers, and so much more. I have such a huge passion for helping people, for marketing, and for spirituality, and I just really wanted to combine them all into one. So I decided to create this really awesome program to help musicians with not only marketing, but empowering their mindset. We need more positivity and empowerment for musicians as a whole and the world as a whole, and I feel like this is a really great starting place. I look forward to seeing you inside the program. back on Mary and Costello on Bear All and we are with our guest Tony Luke Jr. and I know that right now we are going to bear all a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Now all of us have our own health challenges that we experience from time to time and in some cases lifelong. Can you share what you're going through right now? Well um, this March 27th will be two years since I lost my son to a heroin overdose. So, when he died, um, unless you've lost a child, it's very difficult to explain to you what that feels like. Um, and I didn't understand his addiction, I have to be honest. In the beginning, I didn't understand it because when I was younger, I was what you would call a meth head. And meth was my drug of choice and then I mixed all these different drugs and and I was rushed to the hospital and I just stopped because 
didn't want to die. Right. So I couldn't understand why he couldn't just stop. And then I realized, thank God I realized it a few months before he passed, because it would have killed me if I didn't get it till after he died. I realized that there is a huge difference between someone with a drug problem mm -hmm. and someone who suffers from addiction. They are not the same thing. Okay, one gets high right. because they like to. The other self-medicates to numb a mental health issue. Pierre, and there is, there is no exception to that rule. And he tried, and, and I, what I say when I speak to people, I say is heroin, and this is the truth. Hero, heroin might have took my son's life, but the stigma is what killed him. Right. And I was sitting at, at my uh, store uh, in Sicklerville, New Jersey, and it had been about a month or so since Tony passed. And um, I was completely devastated. And right. this elderly gentleman came in and he said, Tony, I don't mean to bother you. He said, I just want to say I'm really sorry for your loss. He said, do you mind if I asked you, was it cancer? And I said, no, he died of a heroin overdose. And he got very angry. And he was like, see, damn it, what these kids do, the choices that they make. And I just thought, I didn't get angry. I remember thinking, wow, this is what my son felt every single day of his life. And I knew that I didn't need to start a foundation. I didn't need to open up a recovery center. I'd, I knew that my battle was with the stigma attached to it, that people were afraid to mention it. They hid it. And I was thinking about, I was speaking to a couple friends of mine and we came up with brown and white because they were the two primary colors of heroin. And I thought, my son was not a number of statistic. Uh, I wanted people to know that my son was a human being. Right. And he battled de depression and he battled a lot of things that most people in addiction battle. And I thought, let's start a hashtag, brown and white. We don't collect money, we don't do any of those things. And I was asking people that lost a loved one to addiction to post a picture of their loved one with their loved one's name and let the world know that this is not a number, this is not a statistic. This is my daughter, this is my son, this is my husband, my, my wife, my mother, my brother, my sister and that they lived and they loved and they are not scum, right. they are not dirt, Absolutely. and it is not a choice. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it. The, the first thing that inspired me is this, this elderly woman posted on Facebook and she was really, she was like, am I on camera? Like she wasn't, didn't even get it right. And she said, this is my daughter and I loved her and she is not a piece of dirt and she is not worthless and she died and I loved her and I missed her. And then it, it really started to catch on. And then Philadelphia Magazine did an article on me about the problems I had with my dad and my brother and, and then losing my son, Tony. And they called me up and they said, would you mind coming on the show and speak about the article? And I said, no. And they were like, I said, I'll come on the show and I'll speak, but it will be about brown and white. It will not be about the, the problem, my inner family issue. Right. It'll be about something that's important. And they agreed to it. And I told the truth and I, I told how I felt. And the video got like 2 million hits in like an hour. And it started to go viral. And I realized that people w wanted to feel like they weren't the only one that felt that way. And they gotta remember, I'm doing brown and white after only a few months after Tony passed away, he passed away in March and I'm doing this in June. And I'm, I still haven't had a chance to process what was going on, but I felt like this was the journey I was supposed to be on. And people were calling me to speak to other parents that lost a child and, and you know, how do I get up every day? And how do I, how do I do this? And how do I speak? And how can you talk about it? And because literally here's the deal. You lose a child, you literally have two choices. First of all, when they die, you die. So you could go in a corner and wait for your heart to stop right. or kill yourself. 
Or you can give value to the life that was lost by maybe saving someone else. If I had someone speaking to me as I speak to people, I would have understood addiction more. I would have understood the mental health aspect to it. And would, I have, would it have saved my son? I don't know that. Would my son still be alive? I don't know that. Right. But I know I would have been a much better father to him. I would have been more understanding to him. And I don't know what the outcome would have been, but the recovery system in this country, it, it doesn't work. I have a, a very dear friend of mine, his name is Gary. And Gary came to me after watching my videos or seeing me speak and he said to me, please help me. I've been, I've been hooked on opioids for 30 years and I really believe that you can help me. And I was like, well, I can show you a path, but you, you, know, you have to help you. And the first thing he said to me, which was really amazing in recovery, and I want you to think about this is, Here's, here's a, a man who is looking for hope. Here's a man who wants answers because no one's really giving them answers. Right. And he goes into a meeting and the first thing that he's told the first day is, just so you know, 80% of you in here will fail. Hmm. With, and I'm like, wow. You know, and I said to him, would you buy a car right. if a salesman said wow. 80% of the time this car is going to break down? The company that made that car would go out of business, yet Absolutely. recovery systems are still the same. Now, I want to make this clear. No one can have more respect and more gratitude to AA and NA than I do. They have saved millions of lives. The problem is, in this country right now, in the situation we have now, there is no room for anonymity. It is the anonymity that just keeps pushing the stigma forward. We want to talk about it because God forbid we do. We don't want anyone to know that we have this weakness. It's not a weakness. It is absolutely a met. Every single person I spoke to who suffers from addiction, when I broke it down, broke it down, broke it down, it all came back to a mental health issue. But then parents look at that as another stigma mm. and they're like, what are you saying? That my son or daughter is crazy? No, right. I'm not. I'm saying that people that like to party too much and have a drug problem get high. Addicts self-medicate to numb the pain. Now think about this. I was having a conversation with Gary in the car and I was probing and, I'm, and let, let me get this clear on camera. No, do not have a degree in psychology. No, I am not a recovery specialist. No, I am not an interventionist. I'm a father who lost a son, who dealt with addiction the way people that have family members that are dealing with addiction have to deal with it. But I knew, and I pushed Gary in a car, and I pushed him, and I'm like, Gary, you can go to recovery a hundred times until you get therapy and find out the root of why you're self-medicating, you will always relapse. And I pushed and I pushed and finally he looked at me and he started to cry and he, and he said to me, did you ever think that maybe the issue I have to face is worse than my addiction? Right. So he would rather die, live in the street, alienate his family rather than speak about the issue that he's self-medicating. So how do you expect someone that is dealing with such a personal matter to talk about it in a meeting and let it out. Right. I'm not saying it can't happen, right? but you know, we, we put these people in recovery for 28 days or 10 days, which is just asinine. And then we pat them on the back and we say, go make better choices. Oh, right. by the way, you don't have a driver's license. I know that. Go make better choices. Oh, by the way, no one will hire you. Go make better right. choices. By the way, you have no health coverage go make better choices. And then if you look at the way the recovery system is set up, it was set up from a different time. The recovery system teaches will power. That's what it teaches. Get to a meeting, call your sponsor. Right. If you feel like you're going to use, get to, that's all willpower. Willpower breaks. Yes. Does not last forever. 
if you do not get to the root of the issue of why someone is using, then they will never be healed. No. They will never be healed. But I, I'm assuming insurance companies don't want to hear that. And I don't know that they don't. I'm assuming. They need to, people that are suffering from addiction need to go into recovery. Then they need to go into therapy, uh, uh, you know, once a week, whether we you know, and constantly for six months, a year to kind of cope, to teach them a different coping mechanism. If you had cancer, would a doctor remove the cancer? Then when you left the hospital said, you got no more cancer. See you No, they go come back for, we got to check correct. every three months. That's correct. Let's make sure. Absolutely. And, and, and they're treated as people that are ill. People suffering from addiction are treated like scum. The word junkie to me is the most horrific, most offensive word that you can ever use. It brings back every stereotype of what addicts go through. And no one wants to be in that place. And I tell families, anyone that's watching, I know what it's like to want to literally choke your child because you're so angry, but it's the addiction that right. you're angry at. It, it, it's, it, it, it's not them. They're in there and they're trying to get out. They're trying to, to, move, to move past that. They don't know how. Right. And let me tell you something. If your loved one's suffering from addiction, so are you. Only worse because families feel helpless because they don't know. They need to be educated. Right. They need to know that this is a mental health issue and it needs to be dealt with in that manner or the numbers are gonna to continue to go up and we're gonna lose people by the tens of thousands. And it's true. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, I really feel bad, you know, what happened to you and it's tragic, but then you live with this tragedy now in your heart every day. How does that affect you and your health? Because I know like around holidays, it must be very hard, things of that nature. When holidays you are tough. I miss my son very much. Right. But my son's death brought so much comfort to so many others and so many other families. Because the truth is, we don't know what we're doing until it hits us. Right. And in Tony's passing, he has made... I hope a difference in other people's lives. And I miss him, but I do have a very strong faith. And, you know, I do believe, I believe in God. I believe that there's another place that we go. That's my faith, okay? Um, but here's the thing, just a little tip. If you meet someone who lost a child, I'm gonna help you out completely. Here's what you say to them. Sorry for your loss, and then walk away. Never to, I have the strongest faith in the world, but don't come up to me and tell me my son's in a better place. Don't right. tell me that. Yeah. Don't tell me God has a reason for everything. I don't want to hear it. Right. Now, I believe that God has a reason for everything. I believe that my son's in a better place, but I don't want to hear it from you. There's nothing that you will say to me that will make me feel any better. So just say I'm sorry and walk away. Because right. any other word that comes out of your mouth is offensive. Right. You're not gonna make me feel better. You're not gonna comfort me. Just, and the worst, this is the worst of them all. Oh, I heard that Tony lost his son. It was about a year and a half ago. They're like, yeah, and he goes, well, it's been a year and a half. Isn't he okay? Hmm. It's been a year and a half. Isn't he okay? We are taught we will lose our grandparents. We are taught we will lose our parents, spouses, siblings. We are never taught from a child that we will bury a child. Hmm. So there is no place no. in your mind for it to go. So it sits in your heart. That's where you need to put it, in your heart. But that grief of losing a child is very different, not worse. I, I never like to use the word worse because grief is grief. People suffer. I hate when someone says, well, my suffering is worse than yours. It's not that it's worse, it's different. It's a grief that doesn't become normal. Like I think of my grandmother and I think of her in a good term. That's my grandmother. Well, she was supposed to die. And she had a beautiful life and I have great memories. My son's supposed to bury me, I'm not supposed to bury him. Mm. So there's no getting over it in a year and a half. Yeah. It becomes the new normal. You will learn in time to manage it better. Right. But there's times I'm driving in a car and I'm singing and then next thing I know, a song comes on or a thought comes in my head. Yeah, that's it. 
But I will say this. And you lose it. Yeah. Music is healing, and you are a musician. And it's, you recently wrote a new song called Walk Away. I wrote a song, Walk Away, and Broken is the one I wrote for my son. Right. And music for you, I'm assuming, is healing? Is, is the, the, old, it's the gift that God gave me, or I would, I don't know where I'd be. Every time I sit in front of that piano and I play and I write music, I'm taken to a place that I never thought I could go to after losing my son. I never thought there'd be a place that I can find actual joy. Mm. And I believe that music truly does heal because if you think like me, I believe the whole world is, make, is made up of energy. Right. There's positive and negative. I don't believe that there's good and there's evil. There's positive and there's negative. And people ask me, well, why are we born? And I believe, as simple as this sounds, almost childlike, I believe that we're batteries. And that we, we not only need to be the most positive battery that we can, I believe that we're put here so that we can help others whose battery is not as positive, maybe it's negative, to turn that into a positive battery. Because then all of that positive energy goes to where it needs to go, and it, it just fuels the universe. And music is energy, it's vibrations. And we can use music to, to heal or we can use, use music to hurt. It, it, it works both ways. And, and I believe through music, we can really humanize what addiction truly is, which is why I know you're gonna ask me about the Bob Dylan tune, Make You Feel My Love, mm -hmm. which we released yes. on video. And if you haven't seen it, I, I tell you, go to YouTube. Right. It's, it, it's Tony Luke Jr., Make You Feel My Love. And I wanted to show in the video that addiction is a human disease. It is not a choice. And these are beautiful people that are struggling mm -hmm. with an illness. And till now, no one recognized it for what the illness that it was. And maybe now, as more people understand it's a mental health issue, the recovery system will change and things will get better. They will. And you're constantly writing music. And I just want to touch on this walk away because um, we heard it. We loved it. Thank you. And I want you to share with people what the music genre is and who actually is interested in this song. Yeah, it's really funny. Uh, I don't write rock. Mm -hmm. I write ballads and like kind of r and I'm showing my age again, r and So I don't write hip hop. I write more r and and ballads. And one of my favorite movies was A Star Is Born. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, Lady Gaga was amazing and Bradley Cooper, and not because he's a Philly guy, he's just a great guy. And uh, I walked out of there and a friend of mine said a line, the closer we get, the further we're apart. And it just struck something in my head. And I said, it was like, it was like midnight. And I was like, we're going back to my studio and we're going to write the song. And in three hours, we finished this song, Walk Away, which was wow. about loving someone very much, but they don't love you back. And there's sometimes in life, there's situations that we just need to walk away from because it's unhealthy. And it could be a metaphor for anything, but I use it as just a metaphor of not being close to someone or wanting to be close and they don't. And I did it and I went to a very dear friend of mine, Joe Niccolo, who has got like, you know, nine Grammys and 30 million out. You know, he did Billy Joel and he did, and here's the weird thing. He's the one who produced Billy Joel's version of Make You Feel My Love, oh, wow. which was really, really yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And he heard a tune. He's like, get in here. Let's do this. And um, the group Living Color, who, by the way, has an album out last, uh, 17 called Shade. Now, they're very, very known for their big hit, you know, is that, that line, that you know, <laughs> and it was like that, that song was a huge, Cult of Personality was a huge hit. And they had won like four Grammys, but they loved Tony Luke's food. So years ago, I wind up getting an email from Corey Glover, who's the lead singer, and I still had it. And I thought, I don't write rock. I don't even know if it's any good because I'm not a rock guy. But I, I, I thought it sounded good and I sent it to him and he was like, did you write this? I love this, let's talk. So well, I've got my fingers crossed. Yeah, college. thank you. But we have to take a break. And you are watching Bear All with Marianne Costello. When we come back, we will continue speaking with our special guest, Tony Luke Jr. We'll be right back.
Hey guys, my name is Danny Felt. I am a singer, songwriter, and music entrepreneur, CEO of Danny Felt Consultants. So I got started in music as a singer songwriter. I was in studios since I was 14 years old, writing and recording music. I started a company called Danny Felt Consultants, which is a company to help connect music producers, photographers, web designers, and so much more. I have such a huge passion for helping people, for marketing, and for spirituality, and I just really wanted to combine them all into one. So I decided to create this really awesome program to help musicians with not only marketing, but in empowering their mindset. We need more positivity and empowerment for musicians as a whole and the world as a whole and I feel like this is a really great starting place. I look forward to seeing you inside the program. Got an idea for an invention? Don't know what to do next? Call my friends at InventHelp. InventHelp has helped over 10,000 inventors get patents. You can meet with an InventHelp representative who will keep your idea confidential and explain their invention process step by step. And InventHelp's data bank includes over 9,000 companies who have agreed to review new ideas like yours. Are you ready to put InventHelp in your corner? Call now, 800-351-1395. back on Barrel. And Tony, I want to thank you so much for being here as a special guest on Barrel and Bearing All. So thank well, you thank so you much. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much for everything that you have thank done. You. And if you have a show idea, questions or comments, you can send them to my email, marianne at barrel.tv. And we would love to hear from you. I'm Marianne Costello, your host of Barrel. And until next time, we wish you love and peace.